Good morning. Welcome to Daily Tanya. Today is Friday, the second day of Nisan. Today is the yard site of the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab. He passed away in 1920 in Russia. And uh, he was uh, much of the commentary that we learned in the Tanya comes from the Rebbe Rashab. In the teachings, they called the Rebbe Rashab the Rambam of Hasidus, the Maimonides of Hasidus, just like Maimonides, the Rambam explained the entire Torah in a very organized fashion. The Rebbe Rashab brought the deepest concept in Hasidus and uh, he taught us in a very organized fashion. So, um, Let's begin the shir, the tzedakah, the day la tzedakah, shemekarevas esageula. And today, we're starting chapter 38 in the Tanya, the last few chapters, al Rebbe focused on, on the importance of mitzvahs of action. We spoke about uh, comparing mitzvahs of action to the study of Torah and so on. And in this chapter, from here, in the next few chapters, the Alter Rebbe is going to focus more that regard, regardless of the fact that we mentioned that mitzvahs of action is most important, there is also a very, very important role to the kavana, the intent in the mitzvahs. But in a, before we get there, the Alter Rebbe begins with uh, continuing the, explaining the fact that mitzvahs of action are most important. And he explains, based on this explanation, he explains why certain mitzvahs that have, in, that involve both speech and intent. But yet the speech is crucial. And the question is why? Why is it so important to verbalize the prayer, um, like saying the Shema, saying the prayer, you have to verbalize them. The brachas, the blessing, I mean, if God reads our minds, if we, if we want to, what is the blessings? We give thanks to Hashem. So what's wrong if we turn to Hashem and in our mind we give thanks. You know, isn't, isn't that more important than just verbalizing? And yet we find there are certain mitzvahs that if you have if you have them in your mind and you didn't verbalize, it's not like you didn't do the mitzvah. Whereas the other way around, if if let's say you verbalize it but you didn't think what you were saying. That mitzvah is still done. Imagine you say, uh, you, tell, you tell your wife, hey, I love you, and you don't mean it. So imagine if your wife can read the mind. Obviously, the words mean nothing. And yet here we say that the, the verbalization of the words is most important. Now, the Rebbe is going to explain this that being that the minds, the thoughts, is connected more with the spiritual part of us. It's, and and uh, the purpose of our neshama coming down here is to transform the lower parts. The action that involves, when you're doing action, involves the vitalizing soul that Animated, animates you to do the action. When you do this the way Hashem wanted, you're elevating that part. And that is the purpose to transform the world. And the same thing is with speech. Speech uses uh, forms of action. Moving your lips. There's the five uh, places where the speech comes out from. And those are things that is the most important in the sense of purifying and elevating this world because ultimately this is why the neshama came down to this world. 
And then he continues why the importance of the kavana, the intent. So let's begin. Says the Alter Rebbe, V'hineim kol anichtov lehei, yuvan heitev psak ha'alocha ha'arucha betalmud ha'poiskim, dehiru lav kedibu dome. In light of all that has been said above concerning the particular virtue of mitzvahs performed in action, and speech, in their elevation of the vital soul to holiness. That's what it does. When you use action, when you use speech, you're elevating the vital soul and it becomes united with Hashem. So one will clearly understand the halachic decision expressly stated in the Talmud and the codes in the Shulchan Aruch that meditation is not valid in lieu of verbal articulation. If you're only going to meditate about the, the word, saying the words, you're not going to verbalize, you have to do it again. Says thus, if one recites the Shema in thought and heart alone, even if he did, did so with the full power of his concentration, I'm thinking the greatest meditation, I'm on the, on the mountains doing his baidadus and thinking, thinking great meditation, the greatest concentration. He has, but he didn't verbalize it. He has not fulfilled his, uh, fulfilled his obligation of reciting the Shema. By merely med meditating on the words that comprise it, he must repeat it verbally. Now, this you can say perhaps why by Shema this is so, because Shema, it's a, the Torah clearly states, it says, Vidibar Tabam, you should speak those words. But the same law applies not only about Shema. It applies also by the saying, the blessing after the meal. When you eat a meal, there's a mitzvah to say the blessing after the meal, to give thanks to Hashem. And that, that is a biblical obligation. And there also, it doesn't say clearly you should verbalize it. It says a berachta, you should give thanks. Thank Hashem. Why can't you give a thanks, Hashem, in, in your heart? Again, the same is true of ble the blessings after meals ordained by the Torah. And not only that, but also in other blessings. Some blessings are biblical. Other blessings are rabbinical. Mushah bracha is the rabbanim. And similarly, with other blessings, although they are merely rabbinic in origin, and also ubit and so too is with prayer. Prayer, the question is even stronger. Why? Because with prayer, how do we know that we have to pray? In the Torah, it says, you should serve him with all your heart. Now, as sages explain, what is the service that one does with the heart is prayer. You pray with the heart. So if the whole idea of prayer is with the heart, it means that it's, it's about feeling. It's about a feeling of prayer and connecting to Hashem. So why is it important to verbalize it? So if you would say, and that this is because that's the way Hashem wants, I can understand. But what is interesting here is that those mitzvahs that combine both verbalization and meditation, if you did verbalize and not meditate, it's okay. And if you did meditate and not verbalize, it's not okay. That is the real question. Why is it one okay and the other one not? 
That's what Alter Rebbe asked for him. Oitzi b'sfasa v'loi kiven liboi yotzei yadei chavasei b'diavad v'ein tzorich lachza. If on the other hand, one spoke the words of Shema prayer, etc., but did not concentrate his thoughts, he has post facto fulfilled the obligation. Obviously, that's not the ideal way. That's not the way one should pray without contemplating, without concentrating on what you're saying. But post facto, if a person did so, he doesn't have to repeat. He doesn't have to repeat the prayer. Except, we're going to soon see, except the first, ver the first verse of the Shema is really something that a person, if he didn't do it, he has to repeat. But other than that, most things, most prayers, if you said, if you verbalize it, and you didn't have the thoughts, you don't have to repeat. And he did not repeat them with, with concentration. Except for the first verse of Shema, and the first blessing of the Shema Nasra, where the law requires one to repeat them if he did not concentrate on their meaning while reciting them. So the truth is in the halacha today, this is when it comes to practical law, so if I put it, the first verse of Shema needs to be repeated if one did not concentrate. But uh, the Shema Nasra, from the blessing of Shema Nasra, one does not need to concentrate, uh, to repeat, you do need to concentrate, obviously. But if you did it without concentration today, the Ramah says that in today's day and age, chances are, even if you repeat it, you're not going to have the concentration the second time as well. So anyway, but obviously, ideally, is one should concentrate, and especially in the first blessing of the Shema Nasra. It is thus written, the tracted brachas beginning of chapter 2, until here, until the end of the first verse of Shema, is the mitzvah, the mitzvah is one of concentration. From here on, the mitzvah consists of recitation. And one has fulfilled his obligation, even if he did not concentrate. So again, that was the question. Why the difference? Why is the, the verbalization so important that if you didn't do it, it's as if you didn't do the mitzvah? And the answer that al gives is based on what we learned in the last few chapters. So we explained a number, a number of things. We explained about the neshama itself, the soul, the godly soul does not need purification. The neshama is one with God, it came down to this world and in, invested in a, in a body in order to elevate the physical world, the physical body, the animating soul that makes the body work and so on. Also, when you're doing things in thought, you're affecting your spiritual part, not the physical part. The physical part is affected only through action. And speech also, in, in a sense, is considered action. This is because the divine soul does not need to perfect, perfect itself through the mitzvahs. Rather, the goal of mitzvahs is to draw down godly light to, perf to perfect the vital soul and the body. The vital soul is the soul that animates the body. This 
is accomplished. The, this meaning, perfecting the vital soul and the body is accomplished by means of the letters of speech, which the soul utters by means of the five organs of verbal articulation. And also similarly with through the mitzvahs of action, which the soul performs by means of the body's other organs. And that's how you elevate the body and the, and, and the vitalizing soul. So here the al concluded, this is the reason why we need the verbalization of prayer, because this affects the real bottom line. Nevertheless, the al goes on now, and begins to explain that the importance of the concentration, the importance of the meditation and the feeling and understanding why we're doing, doing the mitzvahs with kavana, with the emotional feelings and so on. So the Rebbe begins here and he's going, we're going to learn this in the next few days. Yet, he says, nevertheless, it has been said that prayer or any other blessings said without kavana is like a body without a soul. You say a blessing without the feelings, without the concentration. It's like you have a, it's a, a dry thing, like a body without a soul. And that, you know, our sages use the metaphors is very, very precise. And we'll learn this in the next few lessons. Why, what is this metaphor of a body and a soul? It says, the Rabbi Pirush. This comparison of the words of prayer to a body and the kavana to its soul means as follows. And Dalt Rebbe is going to explain that every creature in, the, in this world has a body and a soul. And obviously, the soul has more a greater level of, go of godliness, of energy, than the body. Meaning, the soul has a soul and the body has a soul. Even the physical body also has a soul. What does it mean? There is the life that God makes the soul exist. And there is the life that God makes the body existing. The soul animates the body, makes the body alive. But the body itself, the, the very matter of the body, should exist is also because it has its godliness that makes it exist. Nevertheless, the godliness that is in the body is much of a lower level than the godliness and the energy that is in the soul. That's what Alter is going to explain. Just as all creatures of this world possessing a body and a soul, meaning, Nefesh kol chai v'ruach kol b'sar ish, meaning the nefesh of every living being and the ruach, the soul of all flesh, v'nishmas kol asher chai kol asher ruach chai be'apol mikol balachaim and the neshama of all that has the breath of life in its nostrils among all living creatures. God animates them all and creates them constantly out of nothingness by the light and vitality which he bestows upon them. Meaning, upon both the soul and the body. And in support of his contention, that the body too has a godly life force aside from the soul, the Alter Rebbe adds parenthetically. He says, Because 
This is because even the material body, and furthermore, even the very stones and earth, which are absolutely inanimate, lacking even the sign of life found in plant life, meaning growing. So even the totally inanimate beings has within it light and vitality from God so that it should not revert to naught and nothingness as it was before it was created. This is a concept that the Rebbe talks in length and that in the other part of the Tanya Shah Yichud Ve'emunah that every object in the world is something that is created from Hashem, something from nothing. And therefore, God needs to constantly recreate it. Every single second, Hashem creates it. Otherwise, it will return, where it will revert to nothingness. The Afalpike. Nevertheless, al Rebbe concludes here, you cannot compare the life the life, the godliness that there is in the spiritual soul to the life that there is the, in the inanimate object in the body. Rafa became ein erech v'dimyon klal bein b'chinas oy v'chayu sameir b'guf v'kate b'chinas oy v'chayu sameir b'neshama shi nefesh kol chay. But Rebbe concludes the sentence that we started earlier, that just as in all the creatures of the world possessing a body and a soul, there is nevertheless, I mean, despite the fact that body and soul are alike, in that they both contain a, a divine life force, there is nevertheless no comparison or similarity between the quality of the light and life force radiating in the body and the light and life force radiating in the neshama, which is the soul of every living thing. And that point, al is going to continue in the next few lessons. And what we learn from here is obviously the importance of the vitalize, of the verbalizing of the prayer and that and, and uh, blessings. But also in the fact that at least in the very first sentence when we say the Shema, that is the only exception to the rule that one uh, can, the rule that one can do the mitzvah only by verbalizing, if it, even if he didn't have the intent, that does not apply to the very first verse of Shema. First verse of Shema, mm -hmm. it must also have the proper intent accepting when we say Shema Israel, listen, O Israel, God is our Lord, God is one. We're accepting upon ourselves the, the, the godliness, the, the yoke of Hashem, that Hashem is the one. And what does it mean, Achad? One. That Aleph, Ches, Dalet, that's one. The Aleph is one, Ches is eight, and Dalet is four. It refers to the one God that in these, in the eight, the seven heavens and earth, and the four corners of the world, everything is God. That's, this is the unity of Hashem that we have to have in, in, in mind when we say the Shema Yisrael. This is the end of today's year. We shall you all a good Shabbos, and we shall see you on Sunday, Bezat Hashem. All the best.